Good morning. Um, welcome everybody to um, to the workshop tour of Tidyverse. And um, this workshop is going to be run by Max Kronborg from Mango. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I hope you find this useful. Um, share your video with us, um, but please keep your microphones muted. Um, please feel free to ask any questions using the chat and um, um, Max will try and answer them as you're going along. Um, please use your buttons if you want to um, put your hands up or um, make anything. Um, and also, um, can I just ask if you'd like a certificate from NHSR community just to say that you've attended this workshop, if you could just put chat and um, then we can send that on to you. Um, I'll put a link to the materials in the chat as well to the GitHub and the R Studio. Um, so now I'll hand it to Max and um, I hope you enjoy the workshop. Perfect. Thank you very much Charlotte. Um, so I think just uh, initially a little bit of um, say housekeeping for, for, <clears throat> for me to gauge your experience level with R. Um, Sorry, 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 sorry. Max, I've muted you. There you go. OK, perfect. Um, right, so uh, I was just going to ask basically how much experience people have with R. Um, so if you could all, I think if you go to the participants tab, there will be a yes or a no button. Um, so um, let's just start with if you've used R before or not. So if you haven't at all, uh, hit the, the red cross. And if you have, then just yes. OK, cool. It's quite a lot of green. It's pretty good. Um, one red. Okay. Um, let's just do one more. So let's say, um, if you all untick your, your answers, um, if you've got a medium to high amount of experience with our, uh, click the green one. Um, if you're kind of beginner stage, uh, we'll do uh, a red cross. Okay, cool. That, that's pretty much how, how I'd expect it to look. That's good. Um, just so I don't spend too much time on things that are too simple and I don't uh, breeze over things that need more explaining. Uh, cool. I think that that's probably uh, it so we can get started. Um, I will just share my screen. Um, okay, so if anyone can't see my screen, um, let us know. Um, or I should be able to see, actually, let's, let's try that out in the chat. Uh, if someone can just type yes, if they can, they can see the screen. I'll just see if I, okay, perfect. Awesome. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm assuming you can all hear me based on the, on the responses, but if I've had a few difficulties with this headset previously, so if I drop out, um, let me know and I'll, I'll do something about it. Um, cool. So welcome to tour of the tidyverse. Um, <clears throat> Essentially, what uh, we're going to do, oh, lost control there, talk about today is this Tidyverse package, um, which is uh, an R package that kind of encompasses a lot of other sub packages. So, we're going to cover what the Tidyverse is, uh, why you should bother to use it. Uh, we're going to talk about the tools that are available to you, and we're going to just take a brief uh, look at the core functionality that it offers. Um, so in order to do this, because it's all about data manipulation, uh, import, uh, presentation, uh, we're going to be using some data. So I'll be using some Olympic sports funding data, or you will as well, uh, but I'll, I'll be using that for demonstration. And then we're going to have some exercises uh, where you'll be using the uniresults.csv uh, file. So you should have in your working directory, uh, which you hopefully all have, um, both files. So one should be called Summer Olympic Funding uh, .csv, and then the other should be called Uni Results. Um, so that's another good chance to use the uh, yes and no buttons. Can you just hit the green tick if you have the data, and the red one if you don't? That's so mostly green and a few reds. Um, so I. I think we'll have a link in the chat to the GitHub repo um, that has the two data files. Um, hopefully, I don't know if you could post that, Charlotte, just for the people who don't have it. Um, so yeah, maybe let's just check what everyone has available to them. So is everyone on the uh, RStudio Cloud at the moment? 
or no, rather, is anyone not on our studio cloud? Uh, and then feel free to post that in the chat. I'm assuming that means everyone is on there. Awesome thing. Oh, okay, cool. <clears throat> Thanks, Charlotte, for, for posting that. Um, okay, perfect. So um, yeah, you should be able to either download the files from, from our studio cloud, or you can grab them from that GitHub link. And you basically just need to have them in your working directory um, once we get to that, which I'll, I'll cover a little bit more in detail. But um, good to see that most people have it. So if you go back to this. Out of the way. Yeah, so that's that's the data we'll be using. So the, the Olympic sports funding is essentially just um, funding for each sport at the Olympics uh, for each year from 2000 to 2016. And then uni results is a, a data set containing data on students and their performance on exams. Oh. There you go. So uh, what is the tidyverse? The tidyverse is a package that contains a bunch of other packages. And the idea behind that is to collect packages that cover the same principles or that are built on the same principles to kind of unify um, that philosophy and that workflow. Um, so here are, are a few of them. Um, so like ggplot is pretty, pretty well-known one, uh, tidyr, uh, dplyr. Uh, so the, this tidy philosophy is essentially that you reuse existing data structures so you don't have to um, manipulate data into a different uh, structure every time you're trying to use a different package to uh, achieve a, a, a different goal that's further down in your pipeline. Um, then the idea is to be able to combine functions with the pipe, which um, you may or may not know about. I'll explain what that is if you don't. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a way to make the workflow uh, a bit clearer, a bit easier, uh, and a little bit more transparent. Um, then the idea is that you should use or embrace functional programming. Um, and then finally, to uh, as part of this, keeping things tidy, letting it be transparent um, and reproducible, that you should design it with other people in mind, um, so that they can pick up your work or look at it and make sense of it. Um, so we're going to be using this this kind of workflow today, uh, just to categorize which which part of the of the workflow that we're looking at. So uh, the it generally goes from importing your data, getting a hold of it, tidying it in one way or another, so, so cleaning it up, removing bits you don't want, or representing them differently if they, let's say, don't mean what you think they should mean, uh, which we'll get to, so uh, NAs, things like that. Um, then you probably transform it in one way or another to fit the, um, sorry, it's kind of a question, um, to, to, to fit what you're trying to do with it. Uh, you probably visualize it to get a bit of information on it. Uh, then you'll most likely try and fit a model to it. Um, and you, you can then spend some time in this inner loop assessing your model, uh, transforming the data, looking at it a bit more, uh, maybe modeling it in a, in a different way. And then once you're done with that, you communicate your results to the rest of the world. Um, so Mike has asked whether these slides will be available at the end. Um, they can be, I think. Charlotte, am I right in saying that we can definitely share those? Perfect. Okay, that's good. Uh, yeah, so they, they, they'll be made available. Um, I'll also share the script that I end up writing or the, the different bits of code that I demonstrate. I'll do a, a write up of that for you with some, um, some comments. I'll, I'll leave comments in uh, while I work on it now and then I'll, I'll go back and tidy it up a bit and you'll get that as well. So like I said, there's quite a few different packages in the tidyverse um, and Six of these are the core ones. So it's ggplot for plotting, readr, uh, which helps you to read data in. Um, per provides some um, mapping functionality, which you can use to replace loops or, or to do it in a, depending on your perspective, more intuitive way. Uh, dplyr and tidyr for manipulating uh, data and the, the format. And then tibble, which um, <clears throat> is a package that lets you use these these tibble tables that are kind of an improved version of the, the data frames that you might normally be working with. Um, and then in addition to this, there's a, a bunch of more tidyverse adjacent packages that are pulled in along with the tidyverse, um, <clears throat> which you'll be able to use as well. But these are the, the core ones. So if we take a deeper look at these packages and we start with the import stage, 
there's a lot of different packages for for reading in data and it depends on the data that you're trying to read the the type essentially so readr will cover something like csv files for example um <clears throat> there's json lite for json read excel for excel uh, rvs for for websites um and and a few other ones so the first one we'll look at is rvest which like i said lets you read elements from web pages um, so if there's a web page with a, a bunch of data on it that you like, uh, you, you would probably be using this. So if we um, if we take a look at this example here, there's a link here to a um, <clears throat> it's actually to the to the Olympic uh, summer funding data set that we're going to be using. So it's the same one, but just to demonstrate, we can pull that in uh, from online as well. Uh, I'll just post this link in the chat just so you have it. Um, Looks quite odd like that, but that hopefully will still work. So just to show you, it should look like this. So our goal here is to, to pull this table into our, uh, into R. Um, and there's actually a few different tables here, um, and we'll see how that kind of plays in, how to how to get around that. Um, so if we open up our our studio, uh, either on the cloud or on your your local machines, uh, I'm just going to create a new script. Um, which will be one of the tidyverse. Um, and I'm going to be doing a section on Arvest. So, uh, and actually, what we'll start with doing, because we're doing two of the tidyverse, is just to load in tidyverse. And at this point, I think it might be good to just have another question, which is. Uh, using the yes and no, whether running that command library tidyverse works for you. Um, and you get this attaching packages printout that I have here. Okay, so there's no red, which is really good. I'm just going to give that a few more seconds. Okay, cool. I'll take that to mean that everyone has tidyverse installed, which is very good. Uh, yes, I can zoom in a bit. Uh, yeah, so let me know if you can't see the code properly. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll do a zoom. Is that good enough, or would you like me to zoom in a little bit more? Um, a bit more, okay. Um, so that warning uh, that you mentioned, Natasha, that should be fine. Uh, I'm just going to save this as well. Perfect. Um, yeah, I, th I don't think you should have an issue with the with that warning, but let me know um, if there's any issues. Um, the other thing actually is I'm using um, R3.6.3 and I think you guys might be using a newer version. That shouldn't be an issue either, um, but, that, but there will be a difference there probably. Um, so everyone's got tidyverse installed, then we're going to be using our vest. So we're going to load that in. Perfect. And what we're going to do now is use that link, which hopefully is here. Um, dash there. Um, so we're going to assign this to an object, which we call funding, and we're going to be using the read HTML function, which is one of the RVS functions. And all you really need here is the URL. In in uh, quotation marks, that is perfect. Um, our next step then is going to be using HTML table, which is a, a another RVS function which will let us grab the tables from the HTML that we've just um, collected. So if we run this, it is just it is just the HTML from that website. Um, but because we want the tables, sorry, I'm not sure what that looked like to you, but my laptop just froze for a few seconds. 
Um, so I'll just go back a little bit. We're gonna grab the HTML table from the from the HTML that we just uh, grabbed from this URL using the HTML table function. Uh, so we're going to pass it this HTML, which is in the funding object. And we're going to say that, uh, well, I'll just show this to you. Um, so funding funding um, is now this um, list of different tables. Um, and as you can see that it hasn't really noticed that we have headers in the table. So that's one of the things we want to specify. So we'll add an additional argument here, which is uh, headers true. So if you run that again, uh, all right, because we reassigned it. So we need to run both lines again. And now, uh, instead of uh, having X's for headers, uh, we basically told it that the first line is the header of, our, of each table. Um, so then the next step, because we have a list of tables and we only really want the first one, we are going to just access funding at index one, which is the the, the first table, which is the one that you should have available in your in your Summer Olympics funding, um, which actually, if you wanted to, you could view it. Um, but because this is CSV, it's not going to be that helpful to you like this. Um, but essentially, this is the same the same data set. Um, so that's reading in data from websites. Uh, So the the error you just posted, David, says read dot HTML. It should be read underscore HTML. I'm not sure that's a typo. Or, um, but if you yeah, if you type it in as read underscore HTML, that should work. Okay, perfect. So next step will be importing tabular data. Um, so I'll be using the read CSV uh, path to the file .csv. So um, in this case, my working directory is where the data is stored. So I can refer to it that way. I think it's going to be the same for you. Um, there are other versions. So if you have tab delimited um, data, you can use, use a TSV. If you have something with a different kind of delimiter, you can use read delim and you can tell it what the delimiter is. Um, but in most cases, it'll be a, a CSV. Um, there is also a read Excel package, which will let you read in data from Excel files. The difference here is that because you can have different sheets in an Excel file, um, you, you might want to specify which one it is. The default, if you don't tell it, is that it'll just um, read in the first one. So here, what you just do is you specify the name of it. Uh, there's a few other cases. So SPSS, SAS data have their own um, package. So you need Haven for that. If you have XML files, it's called XML2. And like I mentioned, for, for JSON files, it's called JSON Lite. Um, and I will just demonstrate the, um, the CSV reading in. Uh, so for this, we're going to be using um, the, um, the reader package. So we're going to say that uh, what well, we're going to call this something else. So it's Summer Olympic funding. So we'll say that summer is the result of read CSV. So um, one of the readr functions here. Um, and all we really need here is the location of the file. So I'm storing this in my in my working directory. So I should be able to just type in summer Olympics funding dot CSV. Um, and as we can see here, it's kind of uh, inferred a few different bits of information. Uh, for me because I haven't really told it what it's reading in. Um, so it's read in the sport. Um, and then because it's been split by city here, um, this is actually uh, a number, but it's written as the, 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 the value in pounds. So it's inferred that everything here is a, actually a, a character uh, type, which we can also see if we print it. So um, <clears throat> sports character, 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 which is not really what we want. Uh, but you can kind of see why it, it would infer it this way just based on the on the format. So we're going to add a bit more information to our, our read CSV uh, function call here. So um, we're going to s just specify the column types. So use the call types argument. And uh, that we're going to say that the default will be um, number. So unless we specify something else in this function call, 
it should assume that everything is a number. And the next one will just be that the sports column is the, the one where there's a difference. Um, and that one's going to be character type. And actually these are functions, so we just need to add this. Um, um, sorry, Natasha, I'm not fully sure what that means. So is that for the HTML read or for the CSV read? Okay. <laughs> um, and you're, are you running it locally? I, f I forget. So are you running in the RStudio Cloud instance or are you running it on your on your local machine? Okay, so, and you have the data in your current working directory. Um, so uh, if the, the way to check that, if you do, if you run uh, get working directory, um, it should print out where your current working directory is. So this is my current working directory, which is the one that you can see here on the, on the right. So when you refer to the location of the file, and I, I think this might be the issue, but I'm not sure. So we'll start here. Uh, the location of the file, this dot slash means start at working directory and then find the file there, which is why it's looking for it uh, in this folder. So if your working directory doesn't coincide with where that file is stored, it won't be able to find it. Um, so if you could check that, and if that, if it is in your working directory, then I am not quite sure. And we might need to do a little bit more work just to find out what's going on. Okay. And the, so, so your summer Olympics funding.csv file is in your documents folder. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, so Andrew, if you don't specify this, it might actually work anyway, just because then it assumes it's in your working directory. Um, that actually, sorry, I'm just gonna need this here. Uh, but yeah, if you do that, it'll still work. Um, I'll, I'll get to that error actually in just two seconds. Um, but yeah, if you don't, if you don't specify it, it it'll, just assume that's what you're doing. But let's say you had a, a data folder in your working directory, you'd have to do uh, this in order to say, start in my working directory and then work in a, in a given direction. Uh, all right, so, uh, sorry, Natasha, I'll, I'll get back to, to that. So you've libraried RVEST and you've run read HTML on this URL, which definitely works for you if you open the website as well, hopefully. Um, so what I did here was I used the funding object when I ran this without the header equals true. And I have I overwrote the funding object. So when I added header and ran it again, um, that object reference is not what we read in here. It's not the HTML anymore. So I had to go back and rerun this line. So if you could just try and run both lines of code just to check that 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 isn't what has happened and then let me know if that that works or if it's still errors okay <laughs> okay, and so, so, I mean, we can probably, yeah, so what I've done, so, okay, I think that is probably what's happened, so, just to, just to, so that's, uh, you need to make sure it's an uppercase S, um, so if we do this here, um, it just doesn't coincide with the name that it's reading. So it, it's probably just that it's a lowercase s here. Um, yeah, Natasha, so I, I think what's happened um, is that running this, the first line, we now have funding referring to the HTML, 
which is what HTML table is expecting. Um, and when we then run this to extract the HTML table, we're assigning it to, to this funding object. So if I run this, I now have the HTML stored in here. If I then run the next line, I'm now storing the table. If I then run this one more time, this argument is, is no longer the HTML, which is why when I run this again, I get, I get this error that you had. So I think what should work for you is running the top line and then just this one immediately. Um, let me know if that's not the case. Um, okay. Uh, HTTP error 400. Can you can you open the website at all? If you just use the link, uh, are you able to just access that site? I mean, let's just do it again here. Does does that work? Long. Yeah, and Natasha, tell me if that fixed your issue. Okay, that's good. Oh, the website works, presumably. Um, okay, are you running it locally? Okay. Um, the only thing I can... Well, I guess I'll ask you. Do you think it could be your firewall that's that's blocking R from from accessing the internet, or is that not likely? I mean, so usually if something like this happens, the the easiest way to do it is just to look at the um, the error code, RS the error, open connection. Um, so that's a different error. Probably look at this one as well. Bad request response. Have you tried running this a few times just to check it wasn't just a one off? Hmm. Okay. I'm not fully sure how to get around that. Um, I think. The upside here is that um, you won't need to be using this data, so we could move past this and continue. Um, but I am I am not sure why that doesn't work. Okay, cool. Let's uh let, let let's move on then. Um, so if we return to this read CSV, um, no problem. Um, what we've done now uh, is we've tried to specify the column types so it doesn't read them as characters. It's then uh, telling us that there are these NA values, which I could just show you, hopefully. Um, oh, it's actually read that incorrectly. So it's done this for us, I think. Um, but essentially, um, it contains these text uh, bits even in the numerical columns, which are types of NA. We want that represented as NA. It's complained to us that we haven't told it how to deal with them and it's figured out a solution on its own. But the better way to do this is to um, specify it yourself. So the way to do this is with the NA argument. Uh, and what we're doing here is we're saying, when you read in this data and you come across the following values, those should be replaced with the, um, like, I guess the, the digital interpretation of what NA is instead of the, the text versions. Um, so you parse those as NA values. Um, and so what we do here is we pass it a vector, which just contains the different values that equate to, to an NA. And for this data set that is uh, NA, it's NA star. So there's presumably different types of NA in this data set that mean different things, um, potentially for different reasons that that, that uh, value is, is just not applicable. Um, not doing that. Uh, so if you run this, we should get the same data, but we haven't gotten this error code. So if we look at this data, um, we can see that these values are NAs. So for some reason that was missing and it's been parsed correctly as, as NA values uh, without, without these error messages.
So if we continue here, um, that then brings us to an exercise for all of you to do. So what you're gonna be doing is you're going to use the appropriate package and function to read in the results.csv file that you should have stored uh, by next to your Summer Olympics funding. So I'll give you, um, let's say five minutes for this and I'll be here if you have any questions um, and then afterwards I'll, I'll go over the solution. So that is, yeah, five past 11, we'll, um, we'll go over it. So I'll just leave this code up here and then I'll just post the, the prompt in the chat for you to see. So that's the, the exercise goal. Um, and then I think with, with what I've written here, you should be able to, to figure out how to, to read in that file. Um, what you can do in order to just get a look at it before you read it in is to, to, to click it and just hit view file and it, it'll show you kind of what it looks like um, so that you can um, infer what information you might need if you need any uh, in the function you use. Yeah. But um, yeah, post a question in the chat if you have anything or if you want to, you can unmute yourselves and ask as well. Yeah, just to answer that about the, the screen ratios, I have quite a wide screen. Um, so that's probably why the way you're seeing my screen sharing is wide, but not very tall. Um, it's not quite ideal, but I don't really have a better solution to it. Um, so hopefully this is okay. I, yeah, as long as you can still see it, that, that should be okay. Um, and it should be, hopefully be tall enough to just let you see the code or enough of the code to complete the exercises.
Okay, so that's about five minutes. I think it's probably just worth checking how people are doing. So uh, if you've finished this exercise, just hit the green tick. If you haven't, you hit the red, uh, red cross. Okay. So mostly green. And that means it's it's um we get to just go over the solution to this. So uh, it's a CSV file, so we want to be using the read CSV function. And all we really need to do for this data, uh, just glancing at it, it doesn't seem like there's anything we need to interpret as as NA values. Um, so we will uh, create this uni results variable, and it's going to be the result of read CSV. And just a neat bit of functionality here, actually, um, which I think maybe you won't get just using the, oh no, that actually still works. Uh, so if you type in the, the quotation marks and you hit tab, R will figure out based on the function that you're probably trying to refer to a file. So it'll give you this nice little pop-up where you can kind of, um, yeah, I was gonna say automatically, but you can, you can choose the file a little bit quicker than having to type it all out. Um, and actually, if you have nested folders, it'll let you navigate through them that way as well, which which can make it a lot quicker to to type in these these things. So if we run this, um, <clears throat> we get another one of these printouts uh, where we get told what R has decided that our data means, um, which we can just if we just look at the data, um, we can try and figure out what that what that uh, what that actually is. So uh, student ID is all numbers, so R is inferred, those are, that's a numerical column, which is good. Um, gender is character, test scores, numbers, uh, more numbers, and the rest are characters, which seems pretty reasonable. There is this graduation date, <coughs> which you could argue should be some type of date, uh, data type, uh, which, um, especially because you might want to be able to use it in a, mm, as a date in your analysis for whatever reason. Uh, later on, depending on the analysis you're doing. Um, we'll get to that later, but other than that, um, R has mostly correctly interpreted our values here. So you don't really need to add anything in like this call types uh, argument. You could do it for good measure. Uh, arguably, it's the, the clearer way of doing it, uh, but it's not, not completely necessary. Um, so, so that's the way to do that. Um, <clears throat> Moving on, we're going to look at how to tidy the data. So um, for this section, we're looking at the tibble package and the tidy R package. Um, we're starting with tibble. So tibble is a, a table, kind of. Um, so it's, a, it's an updated, improved version of data frames uh, with a few differences. Um, and you can create them using the tibble package. So these extra features are uh, when you print it, like I've been doing, and you only get the top 10 rows instead of everything, uh, probably because you don't always need to print everything, especially if you have a lot of data. It doesn't let you have row names. Um, and if you have a data set um, that already has row names and you convert it to a, a table, which I'll, I'll show you how to do, it actually just removes them. Um, and then uh, finally, the character columns won't automatically be converted to factor variable types. Um, or data types, so so factors are just categorical variables, and data frames <clears throat> assumes if you have text in your in your data, it's a it's a factor, and you might not always want that, so it doesn't automatically uh, do it. Uh, you can go back and and add that in yourself where you you need to. The other thing with Tibble is because the the philosophy around the the tidy verse is that um, we kind of use these existing data structures throughout. Uh, that means the tidyverse runs on tibbles. So if you use something in the tidyverse that's not tibble, uh, you might still end up with a, a tibble table because that's the principle of how things should work in the tidyverse. So you you can often create them without noticing, uh, and you can kind of <clears throat> go on with your data analysis thinking that you have a data frame and actually it's a tibble. It doesn't really make a big difference, but but they just show up uh, in a lot of places in the tidyverse. So there's a few different functions you can use for them. Um, so you can use glimpse to, to get a useful overview of the data. Um, then there's tibble is the function you use to, ah, sorry, tibble is a function you use in order to convert uh, a data frame, for example, into a tibble. And then tribble is a way to manually create a tribble with your own input. Um, 
No, uh, Danielle. So if you specify something, if you use the data frame um, constructor uh, function, well, I'll show you how this works. Um, oh yeah, no, sorry. Actually, you said as data frame. If you run as data frame, um, it'll convert it to data frame. Um, but equally, you could create something as a data frame and then run it through the the table function, and it'll it'll turn it into a table. Um, and then there's a few functions for adding columns and rows if you need to. Um, and then there's a few other things for converting row names because they, they get removed. So there's a, there's a few ways of dealing with that essentially. So if we look at how to create a tibble row wise, um, um, we create a data frame called years and we want this to contain the dates for the Olympic, um, yeah, for the Olympiads that we have in the Summer Olympics funding, uh, which is not in the Summer Olympics funding. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll cover that briefly, Daniel. Um, so it a lot of it is um, is what I covered here. So um, it only prints the top ten rows. It's kind of a few few differences that. Um, within this tidy philosophy, the creators have decided is a better conceptual way of having your data stored. So we don't want to print all the rows. That is kind of a minor point, I suppose. Um, and then this, we don't want row names um, and this character column shouldn't necessarily be a factor. So um, this gets into kind of a, a longer discussion sometimes around the best way to conceptually do this. Um, so there's a there's a book that I'll reference at the end, um, um, which is written by actually a guy who's written a lot of the tidyverse stuff, um, and one of the things he's a big proponent of is kind of yeah conceptually doing things correctly and and things that you shouldn't shouldn't have in your data and sometimes it seems slightly nitpicky. Um, so there's there's something like pie charts are bad, for example, can turn into a very long discussion. Uh, sometimes so it kind of breaks down into to those things but that's essentially why it's been decided that tibbles are the way to the best way to do things within the tidyverse and because we've decided this then everything in the tidyverse should run on tibbles uh, just so things are, are consistent across that that package that's basically it I, I hope that is a good enough explanation I'm sure you can find some more discussion around it on on the internet given the opinions there are about those things um, yeah, so, so returning to, to tibbles, um, we're going to create a tibble with this triple function. Um, and what we want in here is a column called location, a column called uh, year. Close that. Uh, month and day. So what we want for these are uh, Sydney and the year is going to be 2000. The month will be, sorry, that is not a, a string. So the year 2000, and obviously this will be stored as a number now instead of a date, date time object uh, 15. We'll have Athens 2004. 8, 13, um, Beijing, 8, 8, 8, uh, London, and finally, uh, Rio de So if we run this, oh, actually, I already had that closing bracket. So we've created this years object, which is a tibble. So if we just take a look at it, um, it tells us that it's a tibble. And we've got these uh, location, year, month, and day columns um, with the values that we've, we've written here. So that's how we, uh, we can then use this. Um, 
hopefully this will be that helpful actually using glimpse on on years um, it gives you a, a few bits of information about it it might actually be more interesting to use the uni results from the last exercise so if you run glimpse on that's right uni results um tells you number of rows number of columns you could kind of infer a lot of this information from from just printing it this way but that's that's how the glimpse function works and that's how to create a a, a trip or a tibble with triple um, what you could do as well is to convert a data frame so um, I don't know if you all know about this MT cars data set it comes built in with R it's basically always available um, it's one of these um, so it's data on cars the miles per gallon cylinders and a lot of other bits of information that I think was collected in the 70s or 80s and maybe some of you will know this based on the models of these cars, um, but it's it's a it's like a, a demo data set that you can use, which is a a data frame at the moment. So I think if you uh, that might be class, yeah. So if we this function class will tell you um, what what the class or type of, of your this argument is. So empty cars is currently a data frame. If you run Tibble on this, um, then we no longer print everything like we've done here where it's a data frame. Once it's become a Tibble here, we only get the, the first 10 rows. Then we get this helpful uh, printout that says, and there are 22 more. Um, so if we, if we, if we um, use the class function on the output of that, turning empty cars into a Tibble, uh, it's now, actually it's a, it is still also a data frame. It's, this kind of gets into object types a little bit more, but essentially what this means is it's a it's a tibble, and this is the way to check it. Um, so that's how you'd convert what is currently a data frame into a, a tibble. Um, so if we go back to the presentation. So, uh, like I said, the, the idea in the tidyverse is that things are tidy and, and so should your data be. Um, so we have this single structure that's common to all of the packages. So if you move from, let's say, the import stage where you've read in um, the Summer Olympics funding.csv and you want to graph it, let's say you're going to be using uh, VDAR to read it in and you want to use ggplot2 to, to, um, to graph it. So what would be really annoying is if you had to change the the data structure you're using to store it. Um, so, so that's that's basically the argument is that if it's always the same data type, then moving from one package to another within the tidyverse is is very easy. Uh, I've got one more question. Okay, so Danielle has uh, noticed something that we can just take a look at. So uh, she's saying that if you run as dot data frame on a tibble, uh, it won't convert character columns to factors. Uh, sorry, as the data frame. Uh, yep. On so we'll do this with years. Um, so we should be able to do, um, I'm just going to assign this to something. I think you might be right about that, actually. Um, so if we check the class of this, yeah, it does say it's a character, which is interesting. Um, that is a good point. I wonder if it, that's because because it was initially a table and it's been said not to be. Whereas if you create a data frame and you have a, a column that's, okay. That's quite interesting. I did not know that. Uh, so apparently it works that way anyway. So what, what do you mean when you say you imported a, a CSV file? You just, uh, but read read CSV okay but then so what you have from read CSV is should already be it so if you run this um, this should already be a table so um, Just a special table. It's a little bit different, but it is also a tibble. So 
initially this shouldn't be a factor um, and then converting it to data frame um, it's kind of gone through the stage of being a tibble first so i think there's another way we could look at this so um make a very simple data frame um with this um um, we're just going to create this from vectors and then we'll, we'll just ch test it because this is actually kind of an interesting question. Um, just to confirm I'm not lying to you all. Let me check maybe. And then we'll have um, just year. Um, So if we use this to create a data frame, um, we're going to do this using um, a list where we name the elements. So uh, the first element would be location, and that's going to be equal to this, this vector we've just created here. And the next element is going to be the year. So um, we're not going to create the whole thing, but we just want to, to test this. So um, we're going to tell it that's going to be this um this vector year. So if we assign this here, we've got df. Um, so uh, if we check what the class of df dollar location is, yeah. So if you, yeah, I guess if you create a, a data frame from a vector with uh, basically character uh, vectors then it'll it'll convert it to a factor but using the the kind of the tibble root that that's that doesn't happen um that was a good question thanks thanks for asking that actually um so uh we'll return to to the the tidy data principle so uh like i said the goal is to have tidy data and to have it within the same data structure throughout your workflow uh just to to save you time not having to convert things all the time so these tidy data principles are that each variable has its own column each observation has its own row and each value has its own cell so you don't want to store the results of or kind of the values for for two different variables in the same um one in the same cell but also not in the same column so you wouldn't have um, so using the universe results as an example, there's a test A score and a test B score. You wouldn't want to have test A and B score in the same column in the same place. Um, <clears throat> you'd have to come up with a different way of doing that uh, for that. And then you wouldn't want to have the results of two different students in the same row. That that doesn't really make sense either. And, and that would be a messy way to, to deal with the data. Um, this all sounds quite straightforward and pretty obvious, but I think frequently you can still run into situations where that's not the case and you kind of scratch your head and wonder how on earth things ended up being represented this way. Um, there's actually packages for things like that when you get really crazy data formats, um, which are kind of cool. Um, but, but for now, the, the goal is to just always keep things in this format. <clears throat> so TidyR is a package that we can use to uh, as part of this workflow to, to ensure that things are represented in this way. Um, so there's uh, pivot longer and pivot wider. Um, and then there's separate. So I think the best way to explain these, these are actually to, to show you what they do. Uh, but pivot longer is basically if your data is stored in a way where it's too wide. Um, so you have observations stored in a, a manner that is, is is not coinciding with these tidy data principles. Um, you can use that to, to pivot them longer to, to ensure that it is, and that explanation is not great, which is why I think showing you showing you is better and then pivot wider kind of does the reverse. Um, and then separate, uh, you can use if, if a column contains more than one column's worth of, of information. Uh, so we'll just see an example of this and we'll be using the, the Olympic data set. So if you move back to to our studio, um, I are here. So there's just actually one thing we need to do first, just to clean this up. Uh, if we look at the summer data set, it does have. Uh, but actually, you cannot see this at the moment. So there is a, a a total variable in here, which is the 
the aggregate values of funding, uh, which we don't really want. So um, I will just write this down and then you can do the same thing. And then I, I can explain what it does, but we'll get to a different way of kind of doing this. But for now, we just need to remove this. So if you just have faith that the, the comment does the, or the code does the thing that it's, it's supposed to do here, um, just to clean up the data a little bit for what we're about to do. So what we want is that we, we don't want um, essentially entries in this data set where the value here is, is called total. Um, so, so one way of doing this is to say that we want uh, the summer data set where the following statement, which we'll put in here, is true. Um, and what that essentially is going to be is that the summer uh, sports column um, is equal to total. So because that's not what we want, we have the exclamation mark here. This might be slightly confusing, um, but it's not too important at the moment. So, so we just need to run this, this line. <clears throat> um, so what we want to do, and if we print this, it, it won't have changed much. Um, <clears throat> I actually might have already cleaned it up. Um, but yeah, um, so we want to pivot this longer. Um, and um, the data we're going to be using is the summer data set. Then whoop, the columns that we want to pivot longer are going to be these. Um, and the reason we want to do this is that we want <clears throat> each observation to have its own row. And what's going on here is that, I mean, the, the funding for archery in Athens and the funding for um, archery in Beijing are stored in the same row, but they are actually two different observations because they're two different Olympiads. So we don't really want this to be the case that these values are, or these columns mean that there are different observations on the same row. And that's what we're trying to fix here. So we want to pivot these columns longer. Um, so you could write a, a vector here, which contain all of these these names, um, or you could be a little bit sneakier with something that R lets you do, which is kind of this um, negative indexing. So if you write negative in front of uh, a column, it kind of lets you say everything but that one. So conveniently here, we just want to pivot everything longer except for sports. So we can, we can just point that one out and say not that one, and it'll figure out that that means all the other ones. Um, the names two is going to be location. So what we're saying here is that we want a new column where what we're pivoting longer is stored as a as a new variable called location. So so what that basically means is we're going to collapse these into a new column um, that's called location. And the values is going to um, be stored in something uh, a new column that we call funding. So that's that's these entries. So if we run this and then take a look at it, uh, just to compare, I hope this this makes it clear what we've been doing. Um, I know the first time I saw pivot longer and pivot wider, it, it took me a little bit of time to figure out exactly what it was about. Um, so here we had Sydney, Athens, Beijing as, as column names. What we've done here is collapse them into to different, um, different rows in a new column. So uh, what you've kind of done or what we've done here is we've um, created an archery entry for each location and we've put the corresponding value in um, into that, uh, that row. So that hopefully is, is clear. Um, so let's pivot longer, pivot wider. You could use to undo what we've just done essentially. Um, <clears throat> So if we move on, what we've got um, in our data as well is missing values, these NAs. So we probably want to represent them in some different way. Um, and in this case, let's say we think that if there's an NA in a, a column, it's the same as there being no funding, um, which is the case with this data. But it this does allow you to define that. So there are different ways to, to fill in missing values. We're going to go with zero. Uh, but you might decide for a different data set, it should be the the mean of the column or something. But um, essentially, it just it just allows you to um, do something about the those missing values. So um, that'll be something like the top row here. So the way to do that is to use um, <coughs> replace NA. Um, 
Um, and we are going to use the summer data set. We're going to replace, um, and this takes a, um, <coughs> sorry, I should do this uh, list. And that list essentially just contains the, how to fill out missing values for each column. But because we're only doing it for one column, um, we only need one entry in here. So it, it seems a little silly to have a list, but that is that is the way to format it. Um, and we're just going to fill in a zero here. Ah, okay. Um, cool. So I'll just show you what this is uh, achieved. Then I'll, I'll answer your question, Caroline. Um, so now the top row has zero instead of NA, which is what we'd expect. <clears throat> so uh, that question from Caroline is whether gather and spread do the same thing as pivot longer and pivot wider. They're actually the exact same thing. Um, I don't know whether gather and spread will work anymore, um, but they were renamed into uh, pivot uh, longer and pivot wider. So um, I'm just wondering whether there's a good way to kind of test this. If we copy this um, into another. Object, and then we just use this again. again two seconds I actually might be fine anyway um so I'll just test this out with um with gather I think would be the equivalent okay I'm just gonna check this some other way um Yeah, so I think actually what they've, they've done is they haven't, I mean, effectively they renamed it, but it's been retired and it's been replaced with pivot longer and pivot wider. So it, it's the same thing. If you know how to use gather and spread, then you know how to use pivot uh, longer and wider. Um, yeah, no problem. Um, so that's how to replace NAs. This then brings us to another exercise um, <clears throat> and probably also a break, I think. Um, so, I think something like a 50 minute break will, will hopefully let you finish the exercise and maybe make a cup of coffee or something. And then we'll um, reconvene at 11.48 or something like that. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll check how you guys are getting on by that time. But um, yeah, so if you use the unit results data um, in the last day uh, that you read in during the last exercise and transform it so there's only one column of test scores. Um, so for this, you'll need to pivot longer. Um, I'll leave up my code as well, uh, just so you can, I guess, compare what we just did with the Olympics data uh, to the to the unit results data, um, and it should hopefully be clear what you're you're trying to to achieve. Um, and then we'll have a few extra minutes just for a a break. Okay, so here's the exercise. And um, <clears throat> just get rid of this and that. Um, all right. So if I just print this, you should be able to, or actually maybe if I scroll up here, um, I'll leave it at this one just for reference to what pivot longer does um, and how to use it. Um, and then, yeah, I'll see you guys back here in a, in a bit. And um, and I'll, I'll be back before 48 to answer any questions if you have any.
Okay, so that's uh, that brings us to 48. Um, I'll just do another check of how people got on with that. So um, if anyone who's finished the exercise could just hit the green tick. And if you are still working on it or um, gave up, hit the, the red. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, let's say same thing. If you want another five minutes to, to try and do this, just hit the, the, the green the green tick, just uh, if you think you are going to get there. Um, so there's a few greens, but I'm not sure if they were left over from previously. Um, but I think given that, that actually maybe given the time constraints, I think it might be better that I, I'll, I'll go over the solution and then um, you can compare it to, to that. Um, so what we want to do, if we initially take a look at unit results, um, which I don't seem to have stored for some reason. Oh, I'm just going to rename this. Cool. Um, so if you initially look at this, um, this table and we keep the tidy data principles in mind, um, <clears throat> we have student ID, gender, some test scores, Actually, not sure what this is, the course and the graduation date. So most of these are fine. Um, the issue here is with test A score and test B score. Um, these are two different tests, just based on the, the information we, we, we have here. Um, so that means these are two different observations. We, we don't want that, that they should be in separate rows, um, which is similar to the issue we have with Summer Olympics funding. So uh, we want to pivot this longer. Uh, the data we want to pivot longer is unit results. Um, and then we need to uh, specify the um, the columns. So here um, we are going to use the a vector to specify it rather than this negative indexing um, thing because we can't really specify it that way. Um, so it's going to be test A score, and it's going to be uh, test uh, B score. And we're just going to minimize this a little bit. Um, we're going to specify the names. Nope, the names too. Um, so that's um, that's what we're going to name the column that contains whether or not this entry is from the test A score, or the test B score column. So basically, what I'll do is it'll take test A score and test B score and put them on on separate rows. So we're for now, we're going to call that test. We could call it test type uh, or something along those lines, um, but test works as well. And then the values too is what we're going to name the column that's going to contain the values that were previously in test A score and test B score. Um, so we'll call that test score. Um, so if we run this and then we take a look at unit results again, um, what we've got now is instead of this um, double observation per row, we have a column which specifies which type of test we're talking about, and then the corresponding test score. So we have achieved a, a slightly tidier uh, data representation here. Um, I think that will move us on to the next section. Yep. So the next stage is to transform the data um, in, uh, which we can do in various ways. So there's a, actually quite a lot of different uh, packages to do this. So Deepfire, um, I, I was going to say it's the most common one, but it does the most the most common um, things and quite broad functionality. So uh, selecting columns, rows, filtering, uh, things like that. Four cats is four categories. Uh, stringer is for various string operations, HMS is hours, minutes, seconds, so uh, time formats, and Luba date is for date formats. So we start with dplyr. There's five main uh, dplyr or deplyr. I've heard it pronounced both ways. I'll leave that up to you. Um, so there's five main uh, dplyr verbs. So there's filter, to filter the data, select, selecting um, columns. Arranging is for how you want your, your data sorted, mutate is to um, create new columns or to override existing ones and summarize, um, gives you some control over um, various functions you can use to summarize the data. And then there's there's also this group by function, which is a, a way to change the structure of, of, 
of the data or the the underlying structure of it to to change the way these verbs work, um, which I'll I'll show you when we get there. So if we start with um, filtering, and uh, I'm just going to so transforming data uh, dplyr. Um, so uh, let's say we wanted to take a look at um, the Summer Olympics data that doesn't have or didn't have any funding. So that's basically that we're looking for the rows where funding equals zero. Um, we're going to find that by using filter. And we're going to specify the data that we're filtering. <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's called summer. And then we're going to follow that up with a, a, a conditional statement or a, a, a true and false statement, true or false, that is. Um, so in this case, it's it's pretty simple. Funding equals zero. So uh, if you run this and we take a look at this new object we've created, uh, we have uh, a table that contains only the values where funding is zero. If you wanted to add more conditional statements to this, you can use uh, you can just add more arguments. So um, if we wanted the location to equal Sydney and we ran this, then we should have one and hopefully there are values for Sydney. So what we've done now is um, we're now looking at rows where funding is zero and location is, is Sydney. So the way this comma works when you add in another conditional statement is it functions like an and operator. So we're saying um, we need this to be true and we need this to be true. There are cases where you might want uh, an or operator, so we either want this to be true or we want this to be true. You can still you can still do that here. Um, let's see if I can find this. Sorry, I want a new keyboard. I'm just going to see if I can find this key. Um, you can use an or operator to to get the or functionality, but you can separate them with with commas. Sorry, it's kind of frustrating. Just two seconds. Okay. So, um, yeah, sorry, it's keyboard issues. Uh, so this this double bar is your operator. So if you wanted to filter summer where funding is zero or location is Sydney, you would, you would do it this way. So if you take a look at this now, um, it's either Sydney or it's zero. That's not true. I'm confused why that actually hasn't worked. Okay. Um, yeah. So, okay. You only need one of these, essentially. If you have two, it means something else. Um, so here we go. What we have now is it's either true that uh, it's it, the location is Sydney. So this is probably a better example of that. Uh, funding is not zero, but the location is Sydney. So it satisfies a requirement. Uh, and then these other ones, when it's not Sydney, it, it has to be a zero value for funding. And then obviously, if they're both true, that, that's fine as well. Um, so that's, that's filtering. Um, there's a few other we can take a look at. So um, we could use uh, select on our data to select. So, so there's, um, there's different ways of doing this. Um, you could say select location. And if you run this, you get the location column. You could do it this way and add funding and you get both. If you if you add in the last comment as well, you, you get all of them. You can also do it. Um, by indexing. So if you want uh, starting at the second and ending with the third column, uh, you can write it like this. Um, and I, I should say when you do this in R, that just creates a, a vector. So you've said um, we want a vector from two to three uh, and R creates this vector with two and three and then passing that through to select, it goes and collects um, and gets columns two and three for you. Um, so there's, there's kind of different ways of doing this depending on whether it's numerical or whether you want to specify by name. Um, then there's a range. So if you want to arrange spell that right, uh, the data set by um, some column, you could add more in, but the first column will be the one it sorts by primarily or uh, initially. So 
if you want to sort this by funding, um, it's going to sort uh, ascendingly uh, by funding. So though these are all zero now. If you wanted to invert this, there's there's two different ways of doing it. Um, if you put a negative on the front, um, it it inverts that that command to R. So now it's uh, sorting descendingly. The other way of doing this is to use the the desk function. Yeah, which means descending. So uh, it gets you the same result. Uh, so you can use either of those for that. Um, just cover mutate as well. So mutate um, lets you create new columns. Um, so if we uh, use the summer data set and we create a new column that we call funding rounded, um, we then need to specify how that's that's calculated or what that is. And there's different ways of doing this, but you can refer to a column that's already in your data set. So um, if we want the four significant Sorry, if you want to round funding to four significant digits, we're going to refer to the funding column and we're going to put a four here. Just for good measure, I'll make this uppercase. Um, so if you run this, we've now got a new column that we've created here, which is uh, the funding rounded. So this is probably an example of where you can actually see that it, it has rounded it. You can create more of them. Um, just going to put that there. Okay, that's kind of frustrating. Um, so uh, th there are different ways you can define this, but uh, let's make one which is a multiple of the one we've just created. So in this function call, when you describe how a, a new column is calculated, you can refer to one that you've created in the same function call. So we could mention um, this column that we're creating um, in the definition of the next one, and it'll R will figure out what that means and, and use it. So it'll essentially just calculate the first one uh, first and then the second one. So if we create... Um, another column here which is funding rounded multiplied by three and we run this then we've got um, this column which is uh, three times the, the, the funding rounded one um, and I think also we should cover summarize so summarize lets you summarize your data in various ways so we're going to summarize the summary data set and we want to know the mean of the funding column let's say so after defining the data, you can um, use different computations here. You can add in. So if we start with mean, um, you can have mean of funding and mean of actually in this data set. Currently, the one that's actually assigned to this are only the first three columns. So uh, we can't really take the mean of any of the other ones because they're non numerical. If we store the ones we just created, you could say something like you want mean of funding rounded as well. Um, but we're not going to do that now. I'll just show you what this looks like. So what we get here is a tibble, but it's one by one. There's only one value and um, it's named mean funding. You could, you could actually name this yourself if you want. Um, so we run it this way, we've, we've, we get to define the name and there's only one row and it's the mean of the whole column. Um, if you wanted to also know uh, something else, we could do the variance of funding. Um, and we then get another column here, which is the variance of funding. Uh, but again, there's only one row because we've told R to calculate the mean and the variance of the whole uh, column. So the the way to make that a little bit more useful is to use group by. So um, yeah, like I said, group by changes the the way R looks at your your data. So if we group the uh, summer data set by a variable. Um, we're going to do that by uh, location, let's say. So what this means, and I'm sorry, I'm just going to do this grouped summer. So what we've got here after this group, group by call is um, the summer data set. And it's not really that different. Um, printing it looks almost the same, except we can see here that there's a there are some groups in it, um, which isn't used for anything when we print it like this, um, but but it kind of specifies that they are there. It's based on location and there are five different ones. So if we use this now to run the same summarize call, and instead of summer, we use the group data set, what we want that to mean is that for each location, compute the mean of the funding and the variance. So if we run this, instead of one line, we get uh, this summarize split uh, by each location that we have in our data set. Um, so that's where, where group, 
group by becomes um, more interesting. Um, and this is actually a good time just to explain the pipe for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, the idea behind the pipe is to make this data flow a little bit easier to follow and read. So um, here, what I did was I grouped the summer data set, I assigned it to variable, then I put that variable inside of another function call. Uh, if you wanted to make this even more confusing uh, or less transparent, we could have just put this call instead of the data set. So we're basically saying summarize on whatever result you get when you run this. Um, but as you can probably imagine, if you have several operations leading up to this, nesting these data sets inside of function calls becomes really unclear. So what the pipe is, is, let's see if I can remember that. Shortcut for that. Uh, um, probably I can't. Okay. Sorry, I get some weird keyboard issues again. There you go. This is what the pipe looks. Actually, that's not what the pipe looks like. Sorry. This is what the pipe looks like. So, um, the the way to interpret this is that it lets you an operation and then um, tell R to take the output of that and then pass that on to something else. Um, so what that would look like is you group by and then you pipe that, you, you take that and you pass that on to something else. So for example, that could be the summarize call. So if we then put that here, um, what we've done is we've said group this uh, summary data set by location, then pass it on to summarize, which means we now don't need this argument. Um, the the way the pipe works within the tidyverse is you just skip that argument, and R figures that out for you. So what we're basically saying is um, do this and then summarize it. Um, so if we run this, we get the same output, and this statement is a lot more clear than uh, I think either of these two, especially if you continue to do operations on this. So you can continue this for as long as you want. And actually, um, another way to write this is you can, sorry, you can you can add lines to it. So if you wanted to, I don't know why you would do this way, but let's say you had to do some other operation down here. Um, you don't have to write everything in one line. You can you can stagger the lines. Um, so this this, again, does the same thing. You can then also use the, assignment operator to uh, uh, to assign it to a variable. So it'll just say, um, we're going to assign to this variable the result of computing this and then um, passing that on to summarize. Um, so running that just means that this now contains that, that variable. Uh, so that's how the, the pipe works. It's very helpful. And I think it, it makes the, the workflow a lot more clear. There is a shortcut for it, um, but I've forgotten what that is actually, annoyingly. Um, so uh, yeah, if you find out what that is, that that remember it, because it's, it's really useful. Um, we then move on to joining data sets. So this is where we're gonna be using the, um, the years table that we created earlier. So uh, the one that contained um, the different Olympiad locations and then the, the year and the month and the date. So it's gonna be this essentially. So we want to uh, join. So uh, we're going to call that full summer because it's going to contain the funding data and the the dates of those Olympiads. So we're going to run a full join on the summer data set and the year's data set. And we get this helpful little printout here saying um, we've joined it. And we figured out that location is the column that you want to join it on um, because they have the same name. And it that means that we don't have to specify which columns coincide. But let's say that the summer data set, instead of location, it said city. Uh, you, you'd be able to in full join. Um, oh, that's not what I meant to do. Um, in full join, you'd be able to say which ones uh, coincide. So um, if we look up in the help, which, which maybe I should just explain to you if you don't know it. If the you, there's a function you want to know something about, uh, you can type a question mark and then the name of the function. Actually, I'll just show you this, how that works. So if you run this line, 
uh, over here in the help section. It'll it'll look that up for you, and you can you can get some information on what the arguments are. Um, and there's usually uh, just find an example. So here, there's an example of the full join. Uh, you can tell it what the columns are, um, things like that. So um, and then the, there's even more uh, descriptions. Usually some examples. Um, quite a lot of helpful um, information if you don't already know about that. Um, so what we've got here after our join is sports location and funding, and then we've we've joined on the year, month, and day that correspond to to that location from our years years table that um, that we created earlier. Um, so that's joining. There's a like you can see. There's a few other joins uh, available depending on what you need to do. Um, yeah, it, it depends on, on, on the specific data set you're using. And that brings us to another exercise. So using the unit results data that you've tidied up, um, obtain all the records uh, corresponding to females, uh, then sort it in descending order by test score, and then find the mean test score for, um, for test A and B for each course. And I, I think I'll, I'll give you 10 minutes for this. It's a little bit longer than the other exercises. I'll be, I'll be here to answer questions if you have any. Um, I'll just post this in the chat. Oh, cool. So, uh, yep. Uh, Lynn's just pointed out that the, um, the pipe shortcut is control shift M. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, very neat. Uh, so here's the nope. I'm just gonna tell everyone. So here's the exercise. Um, I think you'll need a few different bits of what I've done here um, to do this, um, but this should cover it. So um, yeah, at twenty past, we'll we'll go over the see how you're doing and then go over the solution. give you a little bit of a hint actually for the last exercise so um, when we're looking at the group by function in the way that uh, for filter the way to add additional arguments or conditions um, is to just uh, have a comma and then the the next element that you want to, to filter by group by works in a in a similar way if you want to group by more than one variable um, which which you'll you'll need to do for the for the last exercise Um, so if we just <clears throat> take a look at the data, um, yes, we want this to be equal to, to female uh, by filtering it somehow. So um, for that, we're going to use the filter function. So we're going to filter uni results. And we then need a, a conditional statement um, that is true on the condition that we want. So it's um, whenever gender equals um, female. Is that right? So um, this is what we should do to do get that. And we can see that the result is, is what we would expect. Um, one other comment on the, the conditional statements here. Um, when we want something to be exactly something, it's it's it needs to be equal to. Um, in R, obviously, there's um, usually for variable assignment we use this operator um, inside of function calls when we say um, for this argument you're going to use uh, the following information. So something like mean funding here, we use a single equals to sign um, for conditional statements. Uh, it's a double, and it's just a way to differentiate that this is basically you can look at it as a question where 
like is gender equal to female that's that's what the the double equals to means um for those that that maybe didn't know that and it's like that in a lot of a lot of programming languages anyway uh it'll be the same thing <clears throat> um step two we want to sort it uh by the descending test score so we're going to use a range and we're going to be using uni results and if we just write a uh, test score, uh, we get ascending. And because we want descending, you can either use the negative operator here um, to, to get descending, or you can use the DSC function uh, wrapped around the, the, the column name uh, like we saw earlier. Then finally, we want to find the mean test score for test A and B for each course. So what what this means is that we want to break it down by the type of test, but we also want to break it down by the type of course. So we want to do a double group by. So we're going to start by doing that. So group by, uh, we're going to group uni results. And this is where I, I said that you can add additional groupings by adding another comma and then the, the next column that you want to group by. So um, you want to first group by test. And then we want to group by the uh, course. And then uh, we're going to use the pipe because we need to do another operation, which is to summarize by the mean of the test score. Um, so we summarize. And here we don't need to specify the, the data set because we piped that through to the function already. So we just want mean, um, mean test score. So if you run this, we get these two. Um, Two groups here uh test type and course and then the mean test score for that um that grouping that we've created um we could actually just call this mean test <coughs> score just for a little added clarity um so that's how to do that exercise um The next step then is how to manipulate factors. So factors are a way to represent categorical data and it just lets R know that, um, I guess that, that something like a string, for example, is actually a category and it, it changes the way you can use that to represent data. Um, so four cats is the package to, to use for that. So um, you can change the names of factors, you can um, group levels, you can reorder levels. So um, a level is, uh, uh, one category essentially. So reordering the levels, for example, is changing the way that they're ordered if you had to represent them in some order. So if you, let's say you're graphing um, by the category, the, the the order of the levels will define which which like, which like element gets graphed first. So if you had a, a bar chart or something. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so if you look at this without uh, changing the kind of the, the order or setting a factor level, you would have Athens, Rio, and then Sydney because that's the alphabetical ordering. Um, but what you probably want is you want to order that by the year. Um, so the way to do that is to use four cats to change location into a, a factor type and then to tell it how to order them. Um, so the way to do that, I'll just move on to uh, factors here. Um, um, so we're going to be using the full summer data set for this. Um, and we want to um, use this data set. And I'm just going to start piping things through in this way from now on, instead of having it in the first uh, function that I use. So if I run this, it'll return the data set. So if I type it out this way and then say pipe the result of that through to something else, it'll, it'll just pass this on to the next function that I name. Um, so we want to mutate this. And here we're going to be using the fact that mutate with the name of an existing column will override it. So we're saying we want to create a, a column called location, but because that already exists, it's just going to put what we define it to be on, on top of the old one and it'll replace it. Uh, so we're going to say as factor. Um, and what we're converting to factor is the location column. We're then also going to want to reorder them to um, to be in the 
um, the chronological order that, that we want. So um, we're going to mutate it again. And actually, we're going to do this on the on the next line. We could even do this. <coughs> and we're going to redefine location again. Um, and we're going to do that as um, we're using factor reorder. Um, and we're going to reorder the, the location column. And we're going to then tell it what we're going to reorder it by. Um, so, and actually, I'm just gonna um, <clears throat> kind of demonstrate this in some way. So, um, we're, we're going to move on to the to the the graph that was in the the presentation later as well, which is another another way to show it. Um, but but doing this effectively, uh, what we've done. We'll, we'll reorder the factors to be arranged um, chronologically. So uh, I'm wondering if, if we do this now, because location is a factor. If we arrange um, full summer by the location, uh, it's too many hours. Um, we now have it ordered by Sydney, whereas before I would start with Athens, because uh, actually, yeah, that I can demonstrate because we still have the, the original summer set, summer data set that we didn't join on. So if we run this first, um, we're going to have Athens as the location um, on the top on where we're sorting uh, a character column. So it'll do it alphabetically. And in this full summer, which is now um, a factor and it's been reordered by the year, um, what we'll effectively get is, um, is a reordering based on that. So that's how that changes it. And that's why the factors are useful in a situation like this where the character column doesn't really have the information that you want it to have and to be able to use. <clears throat> so this this graph I was just talking about that we looked at here, um, where it's been sorted alphabetically. Um, after this function call, uh, we'll be able to sort it like this. And once we get onto graphing later in the course, I'll, I'll show you this. And <clears throat> that then brings us to string R, which um, allows you to operate on strings. Strings are, um, yeah, character strings. So letters, words um, that you have told R is, um, it's just characters, so not, not factors. And um, I'll just give you an example of some of the functionality here. So uh, actually, I'll just explain this. So some of the things you can do, you can uh, concatenate words. So you can have two different strings and you can put them together. Uh, pattern search and replace um, using something called regex. Uh, regex um, is essentially a way to describe something that you're looking for in text. Um, so you can do that with string R. So if you wanted to replace, um, I'm trying to think of an example here, but let's say all the, the date formats, let's say, um, well, if you have dates as strings in your data, um, you could search for them using this regex to define a pattern. And then you could tell R what you want to replace that by if you want to reorder the, the dates. Although I am going to show you a better way to do that actually, but that would be an example of it. And then you can subset strings. So um, if you had a months in your data set and you wanted the first three letters instead, you could, you could use that to, to subset it. So I'll, I'll just give you a brief look at um, some of the, well, one of the string R functionalities. So uh, just so you can take a look at it. Um, so uh, string R. So we could, um, if we, so let's say we wanted the, the sports column to be all uppercase. Um, we could pipe this through to uh, mutate. And we could then uh, say that this new column we're going to call sports upper is equal to str which stands for string, uh, two. And then there's a, as you can see here, string R provides a few different things you can do. We're going to use string R, uh, string to upper. And we're just going to tell it to do that using the sports column. So if we run this, we've created this new column, which is just take the, the value in sports and make it all uppercase. Uh, so it's, that's a very simple example, but it's functionality like that you can use to, to tidy up your data. <coughs> I think next up will be uh, dates. So we do that with a package called Lubridate. Um, <clears throat> so um, it's just essentially easy, easy functions that let you convert character formats into to dates. Um, so um, 
you can choose the format you like, uh, year, month, date, uh, day, month, date, year, uh, and so forth. Um, you can also use it to extract elements. So once it's in the date format, uh, if you want to know just the month or the, the day, or you want to, so there's a lot of different um, functions for this. Um, I'm trying to find um, an example of something to relate it to, but um, you could get the weekday, for example, from a date if you wanted to. So if you wanted to know, instead of having the seventh, you wanted it to say Monday, that would be an example of something you could do with that. Um, <clears throat> if you have something you want to do with dates, Luper date probably has a way of doing it. Um, and then finally, there's some arithmetic uh, with time and date. So you can add time and dates together uh, if you want to change the dates by a certain amount or, or do anything like that. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take the Olympic data set and we're just going to turn the, um, the year, month, and day columns into this date uh, format. So uh, the way to do this is the full summer data set. And we're just going to pipe that through to uh, mutate. So um, what we need to do first is create a new column which has the information in it that we need in order to be able to convert it to a, a date time because currently there are three different columns. So we're going to mutate this data set into um, a date column. And for this, we're going to use some more of the string R functionality. So um, our date is going to be string uh, C. C stands for concatenation. So we're going to define a way to take the elements from each column and put that into a new column in a way that is, is readable to the, um, to the looper date functions that we're going to be using. So we're going to concatenate the year and the month and the day. So that also defines the order. And then finally, we're going to tell it um, a separator. So the separator is when you concatenate all of this, should you put something in between and what should that be? So we don't want it just to say 2000 and a nine and a 15. We want to separate it by a, a dash, for example. Um, and then we are going to actually immediately remutate this, um, but we're not we're not going to need to to come up with a new mutate function. You can, uh, like we discussed, you can um, mutate columns that you've just created. And you can mutate the same column into, or you can override a column you've just created in the same function call. Um, so you could you could do this um, kind of like I've done here with two mutate calls, or you can just immediately say that date is now going to be um, the result of a of a Luber date function. So we pick YMD because that's the order that we have um, our dates in, so year, month, day. And then we're just going to tell it um, which column to look at. Uh, and it's going to be the date column. So if we run this, um, so I did something wrong here. I think that should work. Um, I'm just gonna try this without that. So we've got date, and then uh, if we if we pipe this through to another mutate, and we delete that. I find function one. Do not have ah sorry. It's because Luba date does not automatically get pulled in. So. We're just going to um, load that, um, and then we can do this, I hope. Um, yeah, so there we go. Um, so what we've got now is, um, and you kind of saw the in-between step here. So what actually happens first is that we're creating a date column, and it's uh, of character type, and it, we've concatenated the values from year, month, and, and date. And then the second step is convert that to a date type, uh, essentially. So it doesn't really change the format here a lot, but we can now treat it as dates and we can um, we can sort them by the date, whereas before we couldn't when they were, uh, in this case, doubles or in the kind of the intermediate step, they were uh, it was a character. <clears throat> so uh, let's say we wanted to arrange this by, um, sorry, actually we're gonna do that by piping it through. So we're gonna take the result of this we're going to arrange it um, by the date. Um, and this should now be in in, um, in ascending order. So we've kind of achieved the same thing as we did by making Sydney a, a factor and then ordering it by the um, 
by reordering the levels by the by the year. Uh, so in this example, you could just order it by year, but if the dates were, were different, you would have to use this date time object or date object, sorry. Um, so doing this would then let you do something, uh, a graph kind of like this, where you can see the, the changing funding over time. And that is going to take us to another exercise. Um, and I think, let's say another break. So it would be good to start at 12.50, I think, uh, just to, to get as much, cover as much as we can. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do this exercise and then we'll, we'll meet again at, at 12.50 and cover the rest of the, the course or the, the workshop. Uh, so I'll just put this in the chat. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, I think you have everything you need here. So um, we want to change the uni results data set a little bit. We want instead of the, the test uh, column saying test A or test B, maybe test A score, test B score, we want it just, just to be a factor and to read as A and B. Um, and then there's a way of doing that that hopefully you'll find. Um, and then um, step two, make sure the graduation date variable is a, a date object. Um, so you can check that uh, with this, this class thing. Um, I'll be back in a few minutes to help anyone who has questions out. If you haven't gotten to, to that yet, um, or haven't found that out yet, the FCT recode, factor re recode uh, function will let you um, rename the, the levels. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that's what I would use for that. Um, and if you want to figure out how to use it, uh, you can use the, the help functionality. So the, the question mark and then factor recode um, or FCT underscore recode just to, to see how to use that. As well, if, you're, if your cursor is pointing at the the function that you want to know about, if you have it written out, and you hit F1, it'll it'll look it up for you as well. Um, and you've hopefully had a little break and time to do the exercise as well. So if we start with um part one, um, uh, so for renaming the the factor levels, you use um. FCT underscore recode. Um, so I'll, I'll go right now. Um, so we're going to initially start with union results. So what we have at the moment is the test column um, is a character type and it contains two, two types of information or two, I mean, two levels, but they aren't factors yet. Uh, so test A score and test B score, uh, which is what we want to, to do something about. So we're going to start with uh, well, we're going to be using a mutate, um, but because we're um, we're going to pipe it through, so we're going to say that the test column is going to be uh, as factor of the test column, and then we're going to rename it. So the test column is now going to be uh, the result of FCT recode, um, and what we're going to be recoding is the test column. Um, we have two. Yeah, two, two, two levels to define here. So A is going to be in the case where the, the value is test A score. And uh, B is going to be in the case where the value is test B score. Um, so if we run this, we now have A and B. And as we can see here, it's now a, a factor data type. Um, I'm just going to assign this to the, to the variable. And part two, make sure that the graduation date variable is indeed a date object. So um, we're going to just start by checking whether it is or not. So for that, we're going to use this class function. And the way to, well, I guess you, you do get the hint on how to do this. Uh, I think you could use select as well. Um, but this is a different way of indexing the or accessing individual columns. So uh, we're talking about the uni results data set and then this uh, dollar sign. We'll let you then pick out a, a column. So 
we're using graduation date. So if we run this, uh, it tells us it's a character. The other way you could have figured this out was just looking at this value here, which says it is a character. Um, so what we want to do now is is to convert it to the, the right format. So uh, if you look at this, the format is uh, it's YMD. It's the format we we converted or created a new column for in the Olympics uh, data set. So we're going to reassign, reassign this. So it's going to be union results. Uh, on um, right through to uh, a mutate um, and we want to overwrite the graduation date column and we want to overwrite it with the result of uh, one of the loop date functions to convert it to a date format so it's uh, in this case it's ymd uh, because that's what's in the data and the input's going to be graduation date if we run this and we take another look at unit results, we now have a, a date tag here. Or if we run this again, um, it's a date type. That's how to do that exercise. If we return to the presentation, we're now going to move on to the visualize stage. Um, so graphing. Um, in this case, there's um, we're going to be looking at, I think, two ways of doing it, but the most popular one by far is is uh, is ggplot2. Um, so there was initially a ggplot, uh, and I think that's based on the, I think, a book called The Grammar of Graphics, so Grammar of Gra Graphics uh, Plot. Um, but um, the author then decided, actually, this wasn't a very good um, package, so he made, he made ggplot2, which is the, the most popular one, um, because it's the... Hmm, I was gonna say the best one, but it's it's quite flexible in the way you can graph things. So there are other other ways to plot, um, which we'll see. So there's this this quick plots that we'll we'll uh, quickly use, um, but then with ggplot, uh, there's a bit more more um, flexibility. So there's different geoms in in ggplot that you kind of add in to to create the graph that you're trying to create, and then there are different ways of adding uh, the labels that you want to to your graphs as well. So if we start with qplot which is not ggplot2. Um, and we create a simple box plot um, based on our data. So visualizing data. Um, <clears throat> we're going to use um, qplot. Um, and we want to graph the, uh, maybe it's a little bit more explicit. So uh, the data set's going to be summer. Um, we're then going to say that the x value here is funding. Y value is going to be the sport, sports, um, and the the geom that we're using. So the type of plot is a uh, box plot. Um, so if we run this, it takes a little bit of time, and then up over here on the right, uh, it'll it'll show you the graph that you've just created. So um, I think that'll re-render if I stretch a little bit. Yep. Um, so uh, actually, maybe. I guess it doesn't matter which one we use here, but um, that's, yeah, the box plot, although not hugely helpful and not that pretty either, I would argue. Um, so if we then move on to using uh, ggplot2, we're just going to load that. Um, and um, let's move on here, actually, and just demonstrate this here. But that's, that's the plot you should have. Um, and then using ggplot2, we'll create a, a, another plot. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit more complex, but that's part of the, the increased flexibility you have with it. Um, so we're going to start with creating a ggplot object. And the way ggplot works is it's layer-based. So instead of this qplot call where we kind of do everything in one go, ggplot lets you define like a base layer of the graph, and then you add these geoms and labels on top uh, with the plus operator which is going to be slightly similar to the pipe. Um, so, so that's the, the, the way to interpret the, this part. Um, so again, we're going to start by saying that the data set is it's going to be full summer. We could have put that in here, and it would have been the same, um, but I didn't. Um, but it'll be the same, same result. Um, we're then going to define um, a mapping here. So that's going to be similar to the defining what the x and y are in qplot. Um, 
and uh, we're going to do that using an aesthetic, uh, which works um, well. So you make a call to the AES function, and you tell it what uh, your x variable is going to be. We're going to say x is mm, the location, and y is the funding. And then we're going to do uh, one more thing. Uh, we want to distinguish the sport by color on the graph, and we're going to tell it how to how to make sense of that. So um, the sport or the color here is defined by the value of sports. Um, I'm just going to do this. So if we run this, we get a blank graph. Um, and that's because we've created the base layer, but we haven't added any graphing layers on top. Really, we've told it what's the, what the aesthetic is. So we have an x and y axis, and we have these um, these different location uh, values. So the next step then is to add another layer, which we do with the, the plus operator. So if you want a, a line chart on top of this, we call it geom line, which is a. I'll just show you this actually. Geom. Um, then we can see here in the auto suggest that ggplot2 has a number of different geoms. So there's a box plot, um, bar chart, there's a, a lot of different ones. Uh, we want a line in this case, so that's the one we're going to choose. Um, so if we run this, we have more information, but actually no line. Um, a little bit odd. I'm just going to check that this is right. Okay. I'm just going to add a few more elements to this. Um, uh, so we're going to add a title, which is going to be uh, funding by sport. Uh, over Summer Olympics. Um, and then we're going to add in uh, an X label, which is going to be uh, location of Olympics, because at the moment uh, it has this kind of ugly um, yeah, label, which is just based on what we defined up here in the aesthetic. And finally, we're just going to do something to the scale so it shows the way we want it to. So we're gonna say we want scale Y continuous. Um, okay, so each group consists of only one observation. I'm wondering whether I've grouped this. Um, I don't know why it's not graphing correctly. Um, Ah, right. Sorry. So, yeah, I forgot this actually. We want to group by the sport as well. Um, and we need a comma there. Cool. Um, yeah, so that was that was the bit I left out. Um, we want to split the different lines by the sport type. Um, so this is kind of using that grouping functionality again. And then um, in the second bit, we also say, and the way to define the color of each group that we've defined is by the sport as well. Um, so that, that's why that bit was missing. Um, so what we've done here is we've created the base plot with the X and Y axes. We've then added lines on top. Um, we've added a title um, and we've added, uh, we've changed the X label as well. And then we've just changed the set that the, the Y scale is continuous. Um, And we get this plot. Um, then if we create another plot, this time we'll make a bar chart. Uh, so we're gonna create another GG plot here. Um, the data is still gonna be full summer. Um, I have a mapping again, using the aesthetic. Um, and uh, here we're just gonna have X is location because um, we are, because we're doing a, a bar chart, um, then we want a geom bar. And we want to define the, this is again similar to the, well, it's defining the color essentially, but it is the fill of the color, uh, depending on what type of, of chart you're using. So um, we're going to be using light blue. And 
um, we want a title for this as well, which is going to be um, count of sports. Mm, actually, uh, we're not going to use this data set. We're going to be using the no funding. Sorry. So for, yeah, what we want to do here, what we're trying to graph is the count of sports that have no funding uh, for a, a given location. Sorry. So it's um, count of sports with no funding by uh, Olympics. And then finally, uh, we're just going to add a Y label down here. Um, um, it's going to be the number of sports without funding. So we run this, um, we get this Athens, Rio, and Sydney um, count. So for Athens, 10 sports with no funding, well, 11, I guess, uh, Rio a bit less, and then Sydney quite a lot more. Um, and this actually is the plot that we were looking at earlier, where doing the factor V order um, changed the order that we have here. So uh, if we do, I think this will work. Factor of your order, uh, location, and then we just say that we're going to do that uh, based on the year. Um, is that not in the? It's not the year, sorry. It's because that's not in that data set. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to order this correctly. Um, so if we create another one of these and call it no funding, and it's going to be um, full summer, it should have the factor order in it. Um, yep. Where it's not true that full summer uh, dollar. We'll do this with the filter. Sorry, that that's going to be a little bit clearer. Uh, I'm going to pipe that through to filter, and we're going to say um, funding equals zero. So this should then create uh, a different ordering here. Which I think if we do this again, should it change the order to? Um, so now we're ordering. Um, by the by, the year essentially. So that's what we were looking at earlier, uh, adding that factor of your order. So you can swap back and forth between plots. So that was the original one where it's it's sorting alphabetically, and then adding the factor of your order, we get we get this this graph in the end. Um, so this one. Um, so there's quite a lot of different things you can do with ggplot2. Um, different types of geoms, different ways of representing data, uh, depending on what you're looking for. Um, R Studio has all these really helpful cheat sheets. So um, let's see if this is going to open, um, which you can get at. And there are a lot of them on there. Well, they're, I think they're all on their website. So um, and what you can do as well is print them uh, double sided. And you have this neat little piece of paper with uh, a cheat sheet to a given package. So this is for ggplot2. I'll just put this link in the in the chat. Um, but again, if you're looking for a given cheat sheet for a package, you should be able to look up, especially in the tidyverse, uh, cheat sheet and then the package name um, and maybe our studio and it should take you to, to something that has a lot of the information you need. This then takes us to another exercise. So you're all now gonna uh, use the ggplot function to create a box plot of the test score um, split by the, the test. Um, then you're going to add some labels to it, and then you're going to find a way to color it by the type of course that the, the student is doing, um, or the test is for. Uh, I think I'll give you five minutes for this, and then I'll, I'll go over the, the solution. Um, so I'll just go over the, the solution to this exercise. So step one, uh, using ggplot, uh, create a box plot, a test score by test. So we're going to again start with this ggplot base layer. Uh, we're going to be using the unit results data set. Um, we're going to be using a mapping, uh, which is going to be based on uh, an AES function call. So we have uh, <clears throat> the x value here is going to be the, the test score. 
and our y value is going to be the, um, the test. And on top of that, we want to add a box plot. So we're going to use geom box plot and running. Um, yeah, sorry. So this, this plus operator has to go on the previous line. Otherwise, it doesn't know how to parse it. So um, that's the, the base box plot. We then um, are going to add some elements. So because this is a common, I'm going to be able to skip that and just add the next element. So um, we're going to add a Y label. And we're going to call that uh, the test. And then we're going to add an X label, which we'll call the test score. So uh, running this again, uh, we've got some labels. Um, we're then going to actually this bit will not go here. Um, the way to do this is to modify the aesthetic. So the color here is going to be coarse, I think it's called. So if you run this, we're going to get a, a breakdown by by the course and then with a different color for each course. Um, so that's how to cover that. Um, returning to the presentation here. We're moving on to modeling now. Um, we have about 15 minutes to go, so that should be enough to cover this. There's there's one more section as well, so um, we'll see how far we get with it, I think. Um, so yeah, so so for modeling, there's, there's two different uh, packages that we tend to use, uh, uh, Model R and Broom. Uh, Model R lets you do bootstrapping, cross-validations. Um, it's got some model metrics that you can use for, for assessing uh, your, your model performance, um, and it lets you extract predictions and residuals. Uh, so if we're going to try and fit some linear models to the Olympic funding, um, we're going to be using these. So uh, I'll just move on to another section here. Um, So we're going to start by loading, so we can get this right, uh, model, model R, and room, um, and we're going to create a model for um, a linear model to express the funding that we anticipate for a given sport uh, based on the sport and the year. Um, so. We have this funding uh, model and going to be a linear model. And what we need in here is a description of I'm trying to remember this is called kind of a recipe for, for what we're trying to predict based on the predictors that we're using. So we want to be able to predict funding. Um, and we're then going to describe what we're predicting that based on. So um, that's going to be based on the sports, the value for the sports and the year. Um, and we're then just going to describe here that the data set we're using is full summer. Um, so what we get here is a, a model and we can kind of see the, the different coefficients here um, that we're using. And that's essentially it. Uh, sorry, yeah, that's what I was, that's what I was looking for was this is the formula that we're using for, for a linear model. Um, so, um, we're then going to use that to do some predictions. So we're going to create this model. We're going to call it model grid. And it's going to be, uh, it's called a data grid, which is for model R. And the, the goal here is just to add in the data set. Um, so um, Essentially, just the information we're using to predict here. So, um, we're then gonna add something to this. So, we want um, we want to take model grid, and we're going to add some predictions with add predictions, and we're then just gonna pass it the model object that we have. So, th what this now has done is it's added the the predictions that our model generates for each um, entry in this model grid. Uh, next up, we then want to have a look at the residuals. So um, funding 
yeah, let's call it that. Um, it's just going to be uh, full summer pipe through to uh, add residuals of funding model. And I'm just going to rename that a little bit. Um, so what we've got here is the data set with the residuals on it. Um, and uh, we're then going to plot those. So we're going to be using ggplot for that. Um, our data is going to be this funding resid. And we're going to have a mapping, which is going to be x is the year, y is going to be the uh, resid value, and the color is going to be based on the sports value. And for this, we're just going to use a um, geon point. So we'll have a scatter plot basically. Um, or we'll, there we go. Okay, so um, the distribution of the residuals essentially. Um, so uh, yeah, a way to visualize the, the performance of your model. Um, then there is the, tidy function, which actually I think we're going to cover here. Um, so uh, using this, you can graph the predictions as well and then, then view the, the residuals um, here. Um, so actually the, the, the scale is slightly different in the plot I made, but um, kind of just because they're so far away, it would suggest that we need to do a little bit uh, better um, fitting in order to get a good, uh, ah, right. Uh, to get a good fit. So the reason we didn't have to do group this time is because we already told it to split by the color. So um, uh, that, that, that is kind of what happened in the exercise as well. Once we split the color by course, so if we take this out um, and we run this, we get these two, two box plot elements. Um, whereas if we add in the where color is course, it automatically then um, splits it out into into multiple groups. Um, yeah. So um, I think the next element, yep, yeah, using tidy and Sorry, I'm just reading the question. Um, so, so the question was why we didn't use group this time um, before. Let's see. So, uh, do you mean something like yeah? So for geom line, if we did, well, that might not really make a lot of sense to do that here. Um, actually, that still works. That is a good question. So you're talking about um how here we needed the group in order to get something working um I'm just trying to remember why that is actually so um i actually don't know that that is a good question um uh i'll, I'll try and find out and I'll, I'll add that to the um to the script I send over, just for a, for an explanation. Um, so uh, yeah, next step, uh, we're gonna take a look at the. Um, you, sorry, I'll just go back to this because uh, that's where we got from. So um, using um, using Broom, um, this allows you a few different ways of of extracting some information about your model fit. So uh, we can look at some coefficients or uh, some diagnostics. Uh, so if you're using multiple models, that's a, a good way to compare the fit. So um, if we use uh, tidy, not there, if we use tidy down here on the uh, funding model, um, we get the, uh, we get the coefficients. Yeah, um, and a bit more information. So p-values, standard error, things like that. Uh, and then glance. Um, 
for a bit of statistics. So uh, again, a bit more information about R squared values, uh, P values, things like that. And I think that takes us to one more exercise, which we should have time to, to finish. Um, okay, so uh, you're gonna create a linear model from uni results uh, that uses the information from course and test to predict test score. So um, that's kind of explaining what your formula should be. Um, you're then gonna get a hold of the predictions from this model and add them to the uni results data set. And then finally, you're going to apply a tidy and glance to your model just to investigate uh, the model or, or to take a look at, at some of the information about it. Um, so I'll, yeah, you'll get five minutes for this. And then we'll have two minutes just for any, I think, follow up questions. And then, then we'll, or we'll wrap it up. I'll just put this in the chat. Me, it's worthwhile that I go through the solution now just so we have time just to cover the the last bit so um, <clears throat> there's a there's one more section to the course um, and finishing everything in three hours is sometimes difficult so um, I mean we won't be able to today so what I'll do is for the write-up I'll add in the code for um, for the final section along with the answers to the exercise so um with that and then the slides you should be able to to go back and take a look at that on your own if you want to um it's about using per to map some some different functions onto to the data sets so kind of uh, an automatic way of of looping over and uh doing various operations to to data sets which i think is worth taking a look at it is quite interesting and sometimes it can be quite powerful um but, but that'll be the the section we don't cover. So uh, I'll just go over the solution to this. And then uh, by the time I finish that, I think it'll be around 3.30 or 1.30. Um, so uh, part one is to create a model. Um, 
So we're going to call that unimodel and it's going to be a linear model with a formula. So the formula is going to describe uh, what we're trying to model. Uh, so that's going to be the test score. And we're then going to base that on the value for course and test. And then we're just going to refer to the data set that we're using, which is uni results. If we look at this, we should have some coefficients here and an intercept. Um, we're then going to add the predictions here to the uni results data set. That one. Uh, so we're going to use uh, uni, actually, uh, it's going to be uni results get into add predictions. And uh, it's going to be the uni model is the argument here. So once we've done this, we can take a look at the test score and the, the predicted variable that our function or our model provides. And then finally, tidy and glance uh, is reasonably easy here. Uh, tidy uni model. Um, efficiency and some errors. And again, glance. Uh, similarly, quite easy. Um, so I think it's worthwhile ending it there. That takes us to, to full time. Um, I'll be around for another five minutes or 10 minutes, I think, just in case anyone has questions. I don't know if there's anything you want to follow up with Charlotte. Um, I just want to say um, thanks very much, Max. Um, I hope everyone found that useful. Um, I'm just going to say there will be a recording of the workshop available on the NHSR YouTube channel and the NHSR community website. And we can upload the workshop presentation. And um, Max, you said you could write up, so we, we can put that on as well on to GitHub. Yep. Um, and just to say the R Studio Cloud workspace that will continue to be available after the workshop. Um, and just one more thing, if you have a moment, we'd be really grateful for some feedback. So I'm just going to put um, a link to a survey in the chat. And um, thanks again. And um, I think we'll be around for a couple of minutes if, if anyone's got any questions. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks for joining.